Well, that maple bacon was awesome. So <laughs> that was fun. Uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us this evening, this morning, and welcome to our May is All About Maple Environmental Professionals Breakfast Program. As a reminder, the only way to receive uh, notices of our um, events, our monthly breakfasts, as well as our signature events, uh, you can sign up at the, as an EPN participant by going to uh, epn.osu.edu. So uh, there's some of you that maybe are new to our Environmental Professionals Network today. Um, we encourage you to sign up. We have a great array of programs, and we even have some scheduled uh, for the summer. You can see on the back of your program. My name is Jeff Sharp. I'm director for the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State. This is a very exciting program featuring two speakers who commuted in from the northern part of our state and a pair from right here within our school. Before I introduce our moderator for today, though, I want to share some background about an item that I've been sharing at events throughout this uh, spring. Um, this year, we are celebrating the fi uh, celebration of 50 years of the School of Environment and Natural Resources here at Ohio State. We'll be hosting numerous programs and, and releasing six commemorative po uh, posters showcasing areas of focus within our school. Soils, wildlife, forestry, water, and the human dimensions of the environment, which was released last month at our EPN signature event. Our second poster, let's see, I, so you can see our series of posters. You can collect them all. They're going to be limited releases. <laughs> so, but we're excited. They're, um, um, we think there will be something that would be um, wonderful to adorn your, um, your walls, particularly if you're an alumni or if you're a friend of the school. Pick a poster that appeals to you and come to one of our events. So if you're interested in uh, uh, today's program in forestry, uh, which the school has a long tradition of doing research, education, research, and outreach related to, uh, you can get the uh, commemorative poster related to uh, um, that rich history of, um, in our school. We are part of our contribution to this history, including the ongoing work and impact of our faculty and staff um, uh, that have had on the better understanding the changes and challenges our forests are experiencing. Today we have a number of our faculty and staff that are related to forestry, so if you have an interest in learning about some of the research or outreach we're doing in the school, please visit with one of them at your table or uh, after the uh, event. We are also thankful for the collaborative partnerships through the years that we have had with many of our individuals and organizations representing uh, the forest industry. I'll say as director of the school, I've been doing this for five years. Um, I've been very impressed with the, uh, the enthusiasm and the interest and the turnout of uh, uh, forestry folks. There's a real passion in the state. I think it's one of the more undertold stories in our state in terms of how significant the forest industry is. And my college is College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences, I think we oftentimes focus on agricultural interests, but uh, forestry is a, is a major industry in the state of Ohio, and uh, um, we really appreciate um, the partnerships we've had um, and what wonderful stakeholders the forest industry has been for our school, and hopefully we can do a better job of serving you in the future. At the end of our program, our staff will be in the hallway to hand everyone a special full-size print of the forestry poster. So please take that with you and uh, um, hang it proudly. Uh, just as a matter of curiosity, how many alumni of the school do we have here today? Oh, well, we have a good number of you. Great. Yes. And even if you're not alumni, hopefully you, our school has had a, a, an impact on you and uh, um, you can sort of share in our, our celebration. Also, we're continuing our collaboration with Ohio State's Facility Operation and Development Department. We work toward making our EPN breakfasts a signature event um, and making them official zero-waste events. It is our aim to divert at least 90% um, of the breakfast program materials uh, waste from a landfill through composting and recycling. So please be attentive to the uh, um, um, waste disposal sort of options out there and uh, put in the appropriate bin. Um, and we'll, we have staff that I think can help you out if you're having a hard time interpreting it. The signing sometimes can be confusing. But our goal is to uh, um, um, you know, make this uh, as environmentally friendly event as possible. And, and welcome to the 4-H Center, which is a great facility to be celebrating the environment. Now it's time to hand off the program to our experts. Our program's moderator today is Dr. Saeed Mahmoud. Uh, he'll be providing some opening comments on our topic and will introduce each of our speakers as it becomes uh, their time at the podium in the order listed in the program. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Mahmoud to uh, Ohio State University. He's an associate professor of natural resources, uh, resource economics in, in our school. He arrived in Ohio in, uh, um, uh, just last year from the University of Arkansas at Monticello. Uh, he received his PhD from Auburn University in Force Economics and Policy. Um, we've got him working hard in terms of teaching. He just finished up his first class here at Ohio State, and I think it went very well for him. He's also, in terms of a stakeholder, a champion for the uh, um, forest industry. We've got him um, tasked with sort of developing some materials that can sort of really tell the story of the economic impact of forestry in Ohio, and we think that's going to be a valuable contribution to helping make the case for uh, this important natural resource sector. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, um, Saeed. Good morning. Come on, with all that, 
After all that sugar, you should be more perked up than this. <laughs> right. um, thank you, Jeff, for the nice introduction. I do have a question for you, Jeff. Is, is he still here? <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, can I still claim that I'm new, or is the honeymoon over? <laughs> um, anyway, so let's say I'm a newer faculty here at SENR. And uh, as Jeff mentioned, I started uh, just under a year ago in July of last year, and I moved here, up here from the south. And I'm enjoying every moment of my uh, stay here at my, in my newly adopted home state. Uh, my wife is here today in attendance, so I, in the interest of staying married, I wouldn't say that you know, the decision to come up here was the best decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> but it was good. It was a good one. <laughs> OK. Um, you know, as uh, if you, if when one has been in school as long as I have, not unlike many of you, uh, you tend to acquire different hats that we tend to wear from time to time, and and that kind of filters our vision uh, or how we approach natural resource and environmental issues. So. Please allow me a few minutes to introduce today's topic through one of some of those hats that I have acquired over the years and tend to wear from time to time. Um, my college life started with an undergraduate degree in forestry. So if I were to put on my forester's hat right, and look at maple through, through that filter, just think about how beautiful of a vision that would be, right? I mean, who in their right mind would say that they didn't like maple? Right? It's, it's a beautiful tree. Uh, the people of the greater Midwest and the Northeast absolutely loves the, you know, maple. In fact, if we were to go outside of our borders, then our neighbors to the north you know, their love for maple is actually symbolized formally with the leaf right on their flag, right? So that says something. That says, that tells us how much people love and adore this, this particular uh, species uh, or group of species. Um, they are a very, very important component of our forests, okay, in, in Ohio. Uh, all the species of maple are, they account for about 21% of all live, the volume of all live trees in Ohio, in the Ohio forests. Uh, the net growth of the growing stock, foresters speak, <laughs> uh, is about 90 million cubic feet per year. And, and the removal is, is about 30 million cubic feet a year. So that gives us the growth to drain ratio of about three to one, which any forester would tell you is a really healthy one. Um, so once I've completed my forestry degree, I decided to, to get a master's uh, degree, pursue a master's degree. Incidentally, that's also when I moved to the US, almost, actually two months shy of 25 years ago now. Uh, so I went to Maine uh, to do a master's uh, and this time, it, by that time, it had occurred to me that you know, most environmental and natural resource issues and their solutions tend to have economic dimensions, right? So I, I decided to specialize in economics. Now, getting back to the maple species again, of course, um, the timber from both hard and soft maples are used for a variety of different products, different goods. But really, what's more important today uh, more relevant, I suppose, would be a group of goods that we often call non-timber forest products, right? So as the name suggests, it's basically a class of products that are not timber related, right? So depending on where you are in the world, that could mean a wide range of different products from medicinal plants to mushrooms in the south to wild honey in certain parts of the world, and so on. Right? So maple syrup and affiliated products would fall under that category. And in Ohio, we do have a significant maple industry. We are not at the top. Vermont, of course, had, has that locked up. 
Uh, but we are not at the bottom either, right? We are right near the middle of the pack. Uh, in 2017, and this is a survey of ag data, uh, Ohio produced about 80,000 gallons of maple syrup, and that was worth about $2.8 million, right? Just to give you a perspective uh, of our relative position here, uh, Vermont was at the top, uh, producing about 2 million gal gallons, right? And West Virginia was at the bottom with about 9,000 gallons. So we are, we are solidly in the middle, okay? Um, but let me remind you that this doesn't include uh, all the backyard maple producers, all the people that produce maple syrup as a hobby. This is just commercial production. Okay. And given the vast amounts of maple resource that I was talking about a couple of minutes ago, right, that leaves a huge proportion of that resource, and if you would excuse the pun, untapped. Right? <laughs> So after I had completed my master's degree, um, I knew at, by that time that I, I wanted an academic career for myself, so I, I decided to pursue a PhD. But uh, by that time, I had also realized that simply analyzing a vast amounts of data, as economists tend to do, and pointing out the problems is not enough, right? Uh, and my realization was that we should try to be part of the solution as well. And it seemed to me that for most of these environmental and natural resource related issues and problems, the solution usually lies in the policy arena. And that's why I decided to add a policy analysis dimension to my PhD training. Um, so it seems to me from that point of view, if I were to put on my policy hat now for a second, uh, if we really wanted to grow the maple industry here in Ohio, right, uh, we would have to work in the policy arena. We would have to think of having incentives uh, with appropriate policy instruments that would create the environment for that. And you will hear more, much more about that a little later. Um, then a few years ago, which would be, I guess, in the big picture, about right about the middle of my academic career, I decided to do something really radical. Um, I decided to go back to school for a, for a few couple of years. Maybe it was midlife crisis, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was just getting tired of students constantly telling me how difficult life was for them and I wanted to find it out for myself. <laughs> or maybe it was that I, I was just a masochist or maybe <laughs> a combination of all three, but I went back to school and, and did an MBA. And as it turned out, it was actually kind of an eye-opening experience for me. Uh, I realized that there was this whole other world of, of business development uh, business models, marketing, and so on, that I really didn't know a whole lot about, right? So if I were to put on my business hat for a second, uh, there certainly are opportunities uh, for small entrepreneurs um, and family forest owners uh, to really get into this industry and, and generate a, a new stream of, of revenues, right? And, and if you know anything about family forest owners, you know that that would be a really welcome change, right? Because forestry, uh, even if you practice forestry for, as an investment for timber, still revenues are few and far between. So any intermediate revenue would always be welcome, right? So this was my path to Ohio, right? with all these different hats that I have acquired over the years along my way, I, my short and long-term plan in this position here is to work in all of these areas that I have mentioned uh, and, and try to help uh, the family forest owners and other stakeholders. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for being here today. We have 
an excellent program in store for you, right? We have three excellent speakers that come from very different perspectives. We have an extension program director here to present the practitioner's point of view and talk to you about the science of maple management and syrup production and so on. We have a family forest owner and an active maple producer who's here to give us the producer's perspective. And then we also have uh, a state representative who is here to give us the policy perspective, right? So that, I think, covers all of these different dimensions that I was talking about. Uh, so let's get right to it. Our first speaker is Kathy Smith. Uh, Kathy received her bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University and also her master's degree from SCNR at Ohio State University. Good, good choice. <laughs> uh, she joined ODNR uh, in 1990 as a watershed forester, and then uh, in 2001, she moved to her position within the School of, of Environment and Natural Resources, serving first as an extension associate and later as program director for the Ohio Woodland Stewards Program. She has a wide range of expertise, including forest management, riparian forest management, tree planting, timber marketing, woody plant identification, woodland management, and so on. And she has an excellent re record of service. Uh, she has been the CF, uh, education chair and CFE coordinator for the Ohio chapter uh, of the Society of American Foresters, uh, chair of the Forest Advisory Council at ODNR, member of the State Tree Farm Committee, and so on. So without further ado, here's Kathy. Well, Saeed, thank you for that intro. I will say one thing was my degrees were from the School of Natural Resources before we became SENR. <clears throat> so that actually probably puts an age on it that I shouldn't have done, but. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about um, maple in Ohio from a variety of aspects today. Um, what we need to know up front is that in order for those maple producers to be able to tap trees um, and get that sap out to create the syrup, we need freezing temperatures at night and a rapidly warming day upwards of 40 degrees. Now I want you to think back to this past few months and think about how that fits. Um, we used to talk more about March being kind of the heart of maple season. We're gonna move that as we talk through here and Dan probably will talk about that as well. But depending on which species of maples that you're looking at, um, you're looking to get a one and a half to two percent sugar, maybe more than that in some species, and we'll look at that a little bit as well. But all of that has to be boiled down to get that syrup that you guys enjoyed this morning. And Dan was kind enough to share a couple of pictures. So those of you that have been through sugar shacks before, um, this is definitely much more probably on the high-tech end than some of you maybe have wandered through. Um, I showed these to a few folks and they're like, that doesn't look like any sugar shack I've been through. So um, technology has come to fore and again, Dan will, will touch on that today. We basically have these five species that can be tapped um, and I've listed them here, preferred species being sugar and black maple, um, much higher sugar content in that sap. Obviously the higher the sugar content, the less time you're gonna spend boiling. Um, which is always a good thing. Um, and just kind of a quick, hopefully, reminder of what those species look like. Um, our sugar maples are our upland ones and typically a 2% sugar content, maybe more. And we'll, I'm gonna touch on that, expand that a little bit. Red maple, again, can be tapped. One of the downsides with both red and silver as we get there, 
they are one of the first to bud out in the spring. And so that shortens your season really quick when we get those 50 degrees, 60 degree days, and you start watching the red maples, buds burst, flowers come out, no more tapping at that point. Black maple would be the other one that is preferred, but it's not very prevalent in Ohio. There's trees scattered, uh, but just not as easily found as our sugar maple. Silver maple, as I said, similar to red, more of a wet site species, but also one of those that's early in the season when it starts to bud out and tends to stop the maple season at that point. And then we have box elder, which always when I'm teaching tree ID, say it's the one that kind of breaks the rules. It doesn't have a simple leaf. It has a, you know, this bottomland species that is kind of a scrawny looking tree at times, but it can be tapped. Um, its syrup is more like sorghum, kind of a thicker, darker um, syrup than you would normally get from any of the other species. But they're all eligible. The one I didn't throw in here is Norway maple. Norway maple is not native to Ohio. Um, there are some folks that say it can be tapped. There's also some publications out there that say it can't be. Um, and so I find it interesting that there doesn't seem to be a real definitive answer. Um, but I do know some folks that have tapped it with great success. But that doesn't mean I want you running out and planting Norway maple to tap. Please don't. From the purely forestry side of things, um, I've pulled some data from the last um, FIA report for the Forest of Ohio, which is a 2016 data. And you can see red maples, by volume, the highest species, and sugar maple sits there at number three. So we have lots of maple trees sitting out there in the landscape, and you might want to remember some of those figures as we go through here. To put it in a different perspective, and Saeed talked a little bit about this, here it is in graphic form. You can see where red maples, the blue is the net growth, the orange is the removals, and then the gray is the mortality. Red maple's doing very well. Sugar maple's doing pretty good. If you look down the line, ash really isn't <clears throat> part of our forest ecosystem anymore in most cases as you look at that number. It's kind of depressing. But one of the things that we need to realize, and I um, thank uh, Steve Matthews out of the School of Environment and Natural Resources for some of these graphs that you'll see, um, we have more than 400,000 taps in Ohio, but that's tapping only about 2% of the maple trees we have in Ohio. So there's definitely room to grow when we look at that. Um, and as you look at that map, even if you look at some of the states that we constantly think of as being big maple states, they're still only tapping 10, 11% of the maple trees that they have available to them. So it's kind of an interesting conundrum there as you look at that. So you'd also mention some of the timber products. Maple can easily be used for flooring, for cabinets, think furniture, think baskets, right? Longa burger baskets from Ohio, heavy on sugar maple, um, has kind of decreased in size in the last few years, but definitely we've got a really nice timber market, and sugar maple especially is a light colored wood, and so when the furniture industry changes to light colored wood is that year's push, sugar maple timber prices usually go up because everyone's out there looking for that light colored wood to produce whatever the product may be. Those non-timber products, definitely on the syrup side. But maple in the school also has some history that I had to add in here. Um, Dr. Kriebel worked through the school at OARDC, um, and this is his provenance test that he planted at Worcester um, at Seacrest Arboretum. Some of us were trying to figure out west of Seacrest in 54. We think that this might actually be east of Seacrest, but um, anyhow. He went and he s selected a bunch of genetic material because he wanted to test for sugar content. And so this was his provenance field that he planted. And here he is in 1960 when he started tapping those trees, testing that syrup, that sap, for what that sugar content was. And he found some that were 4% or better in some cases. And those became ones he self-selected for our super sweet trees, which we have several orchards. And I actually think, Dan, you have some of the super sweets as well, don't you? Okay. So... Um, they came out of that provenance tense, 
test that Harvey started um, at Worcester, which was something that we've actually had some re interest in here from some nurseries in the last couple of years about whether we want to promote and try to get some of that seed out and start producing new trees. Also in the school, at one point, Dr. Randy Heiligman was our state extension forestry specialist, and he worked on both of these producer manuals, and the one in the lower corner is the current one, um, and has been translated into French. It's used in Canada. Um, so it's a pretty popular piece of material that was produced here at Ohio State in the school. Now we come to kind of the downside. <laughs> I always say that any more forestry seems to be depressing when we talk about all the, the things that are coming at us. But there are some changes for maples. Asian longhorn beetle is an invasive, non-native insect that is here in the state. It's in southwest Ohio. Um, its primary food source are the maples. I mean, they're kind of the prime rib, but it's got 12 other groups that it also likes to eat on, but maple is its preferred food source. The good thing is we were at a 62 square mile quarantine. Um, USDA APHIS has released some of those and considered it eradicated, and we're down to 57 square miles. So we'll keep working on the eradication, and hopefully we won't have to worry about Asian longhorn beetle. But there's a new pest, of course, sitting in eastern Pennsylvania called spotted lanternfly. As everybody who looks at it says, oh, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Um, in its adult stage, it feeds on Alanthus and grapevines, and so a lot of the foresters are going, yes, Alanthus. However, in some of its other life stages, it feeds on maples and cherries and some other fruit-type species. So not one that we want to see in Ohio, um, we've recently produced an ID card to help folks be on the lookout because while it's been kind of localized in southeastern Pennsylvania in the last nine months, it's been found in New York, Delaware, and Virginia. So it's moving and we need to keep our eyes out for it. One of the last things in that kind of invasive species arena are the invasive plants in the understory. They can so impact negatively regeneration and the health of the trees that are there um, that we really need to focus more and more on trying to keep these out, um, get on them early, remove them as we can, um, and keep your eyes out for whatever the next new plant may be. We're going to talk a little bit about climate change. So climate change is definitely going to have or has had an impact on maples. You're looking at changing precipitation, which puts, puts stress on the maples. Um, and while those trees are plentiful, you've heard a lot of folks talking about species moving north. Um, that's also a potential for sugar maple and for some of our other maples. Um, but there's a lot of components that can go into how climate change can impact all of this. As we look at some of the emission maps, if we stay under the high emission scenario, um, sugar maple will probably start to decline. I mean, that's pretty much the, what the models are showing us. If we can get ourselves to lower emissions, we can keep sugar maple kind of on an even keel. Um, but in all of that, we're talking about the movement of the sugar season, and um, Dan will talk a little bit about that. But I have to say I was at a maple meeting a year ago, and I had a producer tell me that for the first time he tapped in January. And he was actually thinking about maybe tapping in December. And I'm like, whoa, OK. So we really are moving the season. Um, and that can have an impact on the trees. Um, there's some concern about tapping too soon. Um, what's too soon? I don't think any of us really know about that. So there are some things that we need to be concerned with and we need to pay attention to. But whether it's bags, buckets, or tubing, and here's my pun, it all boils down to sap on your pancakes, so thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, our next speaker is Dan Brown. 
Dan was raised on a dairy and maple syrup producing farm in Northwest Knox County. In 2016, his farm received the distinction of a sesquicentennial farm. I, I practiced the pronunciation of that. <laughs> um, he's a fourth generation sugar making, maker helping produce uh, maple syrup from the trees on his farm for over 55 years on their farm. He has been a director for the Maple Producers Association in Ohio for seven years, currently serving as the president. He received his BS in agronomy from Iowa State. <laughs> Strike one. <laughs> in 1977, so here's Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Saeed. When uh, I wrote the 55-year deal on there, I thought, it's a long time. So it kind of, uh, that's not the one I wanted to start with. How I get it to go back. Anyway, it, it reminded me of the, when I was in uh, Vermont one year, and they got to talk, and then there was a guy there that was a little crusty, and, you know, and, and they said, uh, Somebody said, been farming all your life? Or been making syrup all your life? And he looked at that person and he said, well, not yet, but I certainly intend to. <laughs> and I think many, many sugar makers are that way. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's something, it's our advocation as well as our vocation. And so when you have that opportunity, you know, and, and that privilege, every day is usually a pretty good day. Um, <clears throat> when, when Kathy and I were engaged, uh, she, mom was, you know, showing her all this stuff and she looked at, at, at my kindergarten stuff and, uh, and, and she said, what was wrong with you and when you were in kindergarten? I said, Nothing I know of. She said, well, you missed 14 days in March. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm guessing it was a pretty good sugar in here. <laughs> So anyway, I have been at it for a while. Um, our farm name is Bonamy Acres. And back in the 70s when, when there's lots of browns that make maple syrup. And so it's kind of a way of, to, to, you know, separate ourselves. Mom came up with the name of Bonamy, which is French for good-natured, gentleman, you know, that, that kind of thing. Most people agree it fits the women of Bonamy Acres pretty well. <laughs> Sometimes the men, not so much. But, uh, you know, it, most of the time we hope it, it, it does. But when you talk about our farm and the, and the maple industry in general, it all starts with trees. And when Dad came back from the Army in 1948, he grew up making maple syrup as well. Um, and he started on a woodland. I can get it to go. <laughs> Which one do I need to hit? Oh, okay. Anyway, it, it's, it's all about trees, as, as Kathy alluded to. And we had about 45 acres of woodland on our farm. And about half of that was very heavily in, in uh, beech. And so dad cut them down. And he spent his entire life developing that wood lot. And it's a very mixed species wood. It's, it's not all maple. And Kathy's been in our woods. He did a wonderful job of, of forest management. We've planted about 500 of the, of the super sweet trees over the years. And about two of them are, are tapped now. Um, but you, can, you start tapping trees when they're about 10 to 12 inches in diameter at chest height. This tree is probably well over 200 years old, still being tapped. One of the advantages of maple. This is just kind of a side, little side note in our woods. Uh, during the Civil War, 
there was an there was an encampment in our woods. And this is a tree that they used for target practice. And and I, I, I there's lots of stories about how it happened. But anyway, they, they they used wooden musket balls for their target practice. So it really didn't hurt the tree. But anyway, it's still there. It's just kind of a little interesting sideline. <laughs> but but those of us in the maple woods, you know, we are all about maple trees. And this is just a magnificent old tree. Probably one of the best producing trees on our farm, probably 250 years old. You know, these trees, it, just the beauty of them, you know, protecting them and the wise use of them is, is very good. So for many, many years, we were on the tra traditional bucket system, and we would you know, hang the buckets, and part of the disadvantages of the buckets, it takes a lot of people to gather them up every day. Um, you know, it, 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 the good part of it was it was a social time, because it was a time of the year when neighbors would get together and they would help each other, and it, it, was, it was a very social occasion. Uh, and, you know, kids were always involved, so it, it was a good thing. It's also a very damaging way to gather sap. You know, many of the things that foresters complain about, sap gathering, and a lot of them are very legitimate complaints. The other thing, you know, it was the sugar house is, it was, it was always a gathering place, and, you know, it just, we'd have meals there. It was just part of, of, of the life. So today we still have a few buckets. You know, and we still, family comes and, and helps gather them. So maple was, it's a very social activity. And this is just a picture of, of my niece Maggie, and you know, it's, it's the next generation working the evaporator, making, boiling the sap. So in, in 1988, uh, that was kind of a transformative period for our farm. And our farm follows many of the people in the maple industry in that it was a very, buckets are a very inefficient system. And two things have saved the maple industry in, in, in the world. And that is the tubing systems, the vacuum tubing systems, and reverse osmosis. And this is a picture of, the, of, a, of a tubing system as you can see, it's a main line. Everything's degraded, and then the, the lateral line's going off the main line to each tree. Um, it increases the efficiency unbelievable. We, we put in our first tubing system in 1989, 500 taps on a on rented woods. There were many days that we would get t more sap off of that 500 taps than we would get, we would get off of 1,400 buckets. So it's just a tremendous, in we never realized how much we spilled and how much we ran on the ground and, and on and on and on. It's a very low impact system to the woods because now instead of driving through the woods all the time, walk through the woods. You know, it, it's all walking through the woods. You can take that system out and other than some paths through the woods, you'll never know it was in there. Um, for the foresters in here, if you want to know how do you timber, with a tubing system in the woods. It can be done. I rented about a 40 acre piece off a, off a, a neighbor and it was a, a lot of mature woods, wood in there. And I, and I knew at some point he was gonna do a timber harvest. And that system in that woods looked pretty much like that. And he removed about 200,000 board feet out of that woods, you know, and, 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 and we rolled the lines up and we pulled lines out of the way so it can be, it can be done. The, the good part about that was the maples blossomed that were left, Sat, sugar content went up. Uh, it was a, you know, a win-win for everybody, so it can be done. Uh, this is just a picture to show, a lot of people ask, you know, how does everything hook together? And so it, it, there, there's a saddle there that the small lines come into the main line and the drop line for the tap into the tree. So that's all that shows. The other thing that changed the industry unbelievably is the reverse osmosis machines. 
And what a reverse osmosis machine does, it filters the water out of the sap, uh, upwards to about 90%. So what does that mean from an efficiency standpoint? If you take the percent sugar in sap or concentrate, divide that into 86, it's how many gallons of syrup or how many gallons of sap or concentrate you have to boil to get a gallon of syrup. So if you're at 2%, 43 gallons. If you're at 22%, under 4 gallons. So the long and the short of it is we make about 8 to 10 times the amount of syrup that we used to make with the same amount of energy. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. Um, there are RO machines that will... It, it's just mind-boggling, the volume that can be handled. You know, 100,000 gallons an hour of sap can be processed in some of the facilities around the world now. Um, how many hobby producers do we have in here? Or producers? Regular producers? A few? You know, the, the great thing about maple is whether you put on five buckets on a tree and boil it in your backyard, or you have 100,000 taps, the process is the same and the result should be the same. It's, it's all a matter of scale. Uh, and, and so it's just removing water and adding heat to bring those flavors out, you know, that we're after. Uh, again, another picture of our evaporator. This is actually a much smaller evaporator than we had when I was growing up. And at that time, we would make, you know, three to 400 gallons of syrup. Then if you made two or three gallons an hour, that was a really good day. A uh, really good day. This evaporator is half the size and makes 10 times the syrup per hour. And it's because of the reverse osmosis. Just, just a tremendous thing. So why do we jump? Why do we do it? And it's, it's because it's, it's just a wonderful product. I mean, it's just good. Uh, a lot of health benefits to it. But, but for the most part, we do it because we're selling flavor. And it's kind of nice when, you know, you enter some contests and whatnot, and the judges also think that what you're doing, you may be doing some things right. So traditionally, we marketed our syrup, farmer's markets, farm gate. And Dad, he loved to go to farmer's markets and, and talk to people about maple. He, he was a maple ambassador. Uh, <clears throat> More and more as producers expand and, and more and more syrup, we, we now run a, 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 a wholesale in the jug business. And we have about 45 places around the state that we deliver syrup to. Um, and part of it are seasonal, part of it's year round. Um, so, but, but that has changed for everyone in the industry. And now there is a very large uh, the, the larger producers sell a lot of bulk syrup to packers who then sell it to bulk stores, and uh, we can talk about some of those things a little earlier. In uh, 1986, the Ohio Maple Producers was formed. Dad was one of the founding members. Uh, the, the, mo or the, the mission statement of, of that group is to connect, educate, support, promote Ohio Maple producers and products. And um, one of our coming an annual event is the Maple Madness Driving Tour, which we have participated in over the years. It's in March. It's statewide. Uh, it, it's just a chance to get to a local sugar house and, and, and see what it's all about. Typically, there's activities, you know, horse-drawn rides and that kind of thing. But once again, it brings people to the sugar house and people enjoy the romantic side of maple syrup it's a time of year when you know you've gone through a hard winter and uh it's 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 just people like to come and, and see what we do so again the the sugar house is a for at least a day or a couple of days it's again a, a very social thing and a, and, a, and a very much a gathering place and i had this last slide 
we, we now have a Facebook page. My wife, Kathy, does a wonderful job with, with marketing our syrup. And I added this last slide, not to s brag about our syrup, but it's where the Ohio maple producers need to be and where, the, as an industry and, and, and with the university's help, we need to be. This statement should not be made. Um, we, didn't, we didn't realize what a difference there should be. And, and that statement should be made. We are proud of what we make, but every producer should, be, should, should produce a top quality syrup. You know, you, you should be able to say, yeah, your syrup is really good and we enjoy it. But what, we, what really bothers me is that there are syrup out there that is not really, really good. And, and, and that's OMPA's challenge and you know, and, and the university's challenge, as well as, you know, different uses for our syrup, different markets, and, and, and that whole gamut. Um, so anyway, that's what I have, and I much prefer to answer questions than, <laughs> than to speak. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, our next speaker is John Patterson, who is not the direct the president of the Ohio Maple Syrup Maple Producers Association. Uh, Joe wanted me to mention that there is a typo in the program, and so <laughs> please uh, excuse that. Uh, State Representative John Patterson is currently serving his third term in the Ohio House of Representatives. He represents the 99th House District which includes portions of Ashtabula and Geauga counties. Uh, a lifelong resident of the, dis uh, resident of the district, uh, he retired in June of 2012 from teaching at Jefferson Area High School for 29 years. Um, he also uh, served as the model United Nations advisor while he was teaching and his team won accolades all over, uh, in fact, internationally as well. Uh, during his time at Jefferson, uh, he was active in Jefferson Area Teachers Association. He was the chief negotiator for his union from the late 1980s until his retirement. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Marietta College, master's degree in political science and American government from Ohio University. Uh, he earned his PhD in education from Kent State. Uh, he is a Martha Holden Jennings Scholar, Ashtabula County Teacher of the Year, Ashland Oil Teacher of the Year, and the list goes on and on. So I guess suffice it to say that John is a politician, but he's a politician with a PhD and a career in education, and he also sings in the church choir. So. <laughs> true confession, it's all true. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be with you uh, here today. I'm still a teacher, cleverly disguised as a state legislator. And, and I think that's an important uh, distinction to note. Uh, and now I have 115,000 students I take care of instead of... Uh, 150 or so every year. So, being a teacher, I have a quiz for you already this morning. And I want you to connect the dots between what I'm about to tell you and, and then uh, where the essence of, of this, uh, this uh, presentation is going to be. So, here is your question. I want you to connect these facts. $26 billion, invasive species, CAUV, water and air quality, and sap. Can anybody put it together? Well, that's why you need me then. Thank you. <laughs> so I have the longest drive of anybody in the House or Senate. It's three hours and 10 minutes speed limit without a stop, 194 miles. They tease me about it all the time. 
Also, because I represent part of Geauga County and Ashabilla, we are the snow capital of Ohio. So if you want to enjoy winter and stay in the state, you need to come to my district. We also have more wineries than any other area of the state, the Grand River Valley. Come on up. We can have you a nice weekend. We'll make memories for you at the lodge. I have connections there. But we are also, don't take this personally, the heart of the maple syrup industry. Geauga County takes great pride in that. In fact, I was at the Maple Pre Fest Parade both days freezing the last weekend in April because it was such a weird time. You would think you would be able to break out the summer gear. I was in my winter gear going through the parade both days celebrating maple. So good times in Northeast Ohio. Some of you have visited us. You know we are also the home of 19 covered bridges, the longest and the shortest in North America, or excuse me, the United States, longest uh, 600 and some feet. And uh, you do not need a passport to visit us, nor do we speak French. <laughs> so I've given you some time now to think about those connections. So let me put it all together for you. 26 billion, Kathy, you know what that is. That, the latest figures as to what our timber industry indirectly and directly bring to the state of Ohio. It is huge, especially in Southeast Ohio, but throughout the state. Now I might add the largest wooden manufacturer of furniture is also located in Ohio, Holmes County, the Amish. There is an insatiable appetite for wood products. So reality says we have a very healthy timber industry. Now this, I was excited about in a sad, sick sort of way, the invasive species. Our forests are under attack. Those wonderful glossy buckthorns. I know. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say glossy buckthorn? Okay, it's a nasty tree. The birds absolutely love the berries. Now think, birds, berries, birds fly, berries emerge. That's a nice way of putting it, right? And the buckthorn are everywhere. You've seen some of the other invasive species we've had, so we must manage our forests better if we want to sustain this $26 billion industry, correct? So you're with me so far, first two dots. CAUV, anybody know what that stands for? Some of you do. Yes, Current Agricultural Usage Valuation. We fought that battle arm in arm with Farm Bureau. And those of you who know my background know that we formed a CAUV task force in Ashbilla County, presented a lot of our work to, with, with Farm Bureau and were able to, and I hope you saw an adjustment th just this year because it was in the last budget. What was happening for those of you who don't aren't familiar with this, our, uh, back in the 1970s there was a constitutional amendment that allowed for a lower tax rate based on a very complex formula. And we'll just let it go at that. Well, the two major things, low interest rates and high commodity prices, created havoc in our farm industry. I want you to think of your residential taxes. Think what you just paid this year. And then think of them increasing 300 or 400 percent in one year's time without a change in your income. That's what our farmers were facing. So in order to pay some of their taxes, folks in my area began clear-cutting, or should I say wood butchering. And it was terrible what transpired, simply to make ends meet. Which leads me to my next point. I also am the ranking member of the Agricultural Committee. Yes, I do serve on education, and I'm also on finance, but I'm ranking member on ag, an old retired teacher now with agricultural specialization. I work with OXU Extension. I love them both in both counties. Uh, you can tell Eric and David and Les that I said that, and Lee. My point is, we have an algal bloom issue in the Western Basin. And I was looking, uh, it came down last night, you know, 194 miles, three hours, 10 minutes. I was searching for the Cavs game, and I heard this blurb from Toledo, 
And I don't know where anybody from up in that area, uh, they're expecting their first algal bloom pretty quick here, apparently. We know SB1 has to be renewed. I also helped to found the Phosphorus Task Force. We've been studying what SB1 would do in Ashtabula County for the last three years. We have the data now. Uh, we get, you, you can imagine this, lake effect snow. Want you to know, remember when Erie received five feet of snow? It was big news after Christmas. Conneaut, 20 miles away, got three feet of snow. We are used to snow up there. So think of snow-covered fields, SB1. We also get lake-enhanced drain. There are certain times of the year we'll get little mist, we'll get small, but it's, it's from the lake. Point of the matter is, water quality is important to us. And if SB1 were to be implemented statewide, it would wipe out my animal ag. So we've been careful about that. Now, what's this have to do with maples? When you begin to clear cut and wood butcher, it impacts water quality. When you begin to clear cut and wood butcher, it impacts carbon sequestration. You talked about emissions. I was sitting there all excited. My maple producers are telling me we're tapping now right after Christmas, first week in January, some of them, to take advantage of the longer season. They're worried about climate change. Now you have to know something about our maple guys and, and the real president. I'm just president for a day. I was elected this morning. <laughs> I could have the job. Didn't have to run for it. It's nonpartisan. Politically speaking, would you say that our, our maple producers are uh, of left of center or are they right of center? They're pretty right. And yet, these are the folks who are telling me that climate change is real. They get it. So emissions, air quality, water quality. And I want to add something else to you. What Paul Meckling, and some of you know Paul, is constantly telling me the Orange Hat Brigade. It's about habitat preservation, too. We have two of the most wonderful birding corridors in Ohio. I know you get excited about Maumee. I get excited about the Pima Tuning Corridor. It's the second most popular. Conneaut Sandbar, Grand River, the Nature Conservancy campus there. I like that, Tracy, little plug. <laughs> All about birding. And speaking of birds, last Tuesday at this morning, I was in a blind with my local NRA president looking for turkeys. Guess whose county leads the state constantly in the turkey harvest? It's us, also number uh, typically five or better in deer. Habitat's important to us. Those hunters not only stimulate our economy, they also perform a much needed service. Think about the rut, think about driving, and you get the, the, the picture. They perform a much needed service. They also fill, uh, fill their freezer, but it also helps build the family bonds at hunting. Quick story, first day of uh, deer season also was the first day of basketball season. And this, when I was teaching this, this uh, cheerleader came in, she was all excited, hair was done up, had her face on, her eyelashes, she was all, she said, Dr. P, I gotta show you something. What's that? Look at my cell phone. I got a deer this morning with my dad. But don't look at my fingernails because I gutted it and there's still stuff under them. My point is, here is a girl who's going off to cheerlead in the first basketball game, and she was out hunting that morning with her father building relationships. Habitat preservation is critically important for those of us who live in rural areas to continue that bond. And who doesn't value family? So what's this have to do with maple? I've been told that the best way to save a maple is to tap it. So there's a constant stream, I could like that pun, of revenue. That's awfully sweet. So the bill that I worked on for over two years with Representative La Tourette, she's from Geauga County, does this quite frankly. By incentivizing, incentivizing maple production, if you were to tap 
on the average, 30 taps per acre in 12 trees. Now, I know what you're thinking, John, what's a 12 trees about? I can see somebody putting 30 taps in one tree and rigging the system. You know what I mean? That is not what I'm after. So let's 30, and, and by the way, those of you who are not familiar with maple, it's not like they grow in neat rows and, and, and it's all balanced. It's pockets. So the point is 30 taps, 12 trees per acre, zero property taxes. Now right now, CAV uh, Woodland's about $40 an acre, correct, on the average? So how, why do I want to offer them zero? To incentivize them to fall under a forest management plan so that we can combat invasive species, so that we can have a concerted approach towards air quality, water quality, so that we have a habitat for our farmers, for our hunters, for outdoors po folks. And here's the key. I can't penalize my schools or my local governments. So the, there's a hold harmless provision in there that out of the general revenue fund would be held several million dollars that would flow back to those taxing districts. So schools don't suffer. So local governments don't suffer. But we all benefit air quality, water quality, habitat, maple production, it's a win-win-win across the board in conservation. So the bill has been introduced. It has not gone to committee yet. I haven't had a chance to, uh, to uh, work my best magic there on the committee to, to get this moving along. But my point to you today is this. Through Maples, we have a ready market, a sustainable market that benefits everybody <laughs> on so many different levels. And I want to thank you for your time here today. A thrill to be with my fellow Maple folks. And uh, Saeed, we're all yours. If I could ask um, all our speakers to please um, come to the dais. So we'll ask, uh, we have some time for questions and answers, and um, let me start first, but uh, once I get to the audience, uh, please uh, be as brief as possible. Uh, tell us who you are and, and your question, and that's uh, you know, pretty much it, since we don't have a whole lot of time. So, so Kathy, we, uh, my first question is for you. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> like so uh, we heard about maple syrup production as, as a conservation tool. Uh, does it hurt, hurt the tree at all? Uh, to tap? Yes. The timber value of the tree. So when we talk about timber value, so when you talk about timber value, um, there's always been that, oh, you know, it destroys the wood, it destroys the value. Um, the reality is, is that you're tapping in a zone, and so you can harvest above that um, to get clear lumber. But in some cases, there are some savvy marketing folks that are taking the marks that are created by the taps in the grain of the wood and marketing it as a specialty wood and charging more for it. So it <laughs> works very well. <laughs> Some of the practices that have changed over the years. Uh, we used to use a drill almost a half inch hole, and uh, now we're down to a five sixteenths inch hole. So when when you tap, maples compartmentalize very very well, and so when you drill that hole, you have some staining about six to eight inches above the hole and below the hole, the width of the hole. So when you go from a half inch to five sixteenths or smaller, it, it just limits the amount of wood that gets damaged uh, in that tree, uh, and the trees heal so much more quickly than they used to. Uh, they, they will heal up within a year now and, and life goes on. Yeah. Um, Dan, um, <laughs> we, we heard about uh, 
climate change and its effect on, on maple uh, syrup production. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, if you were to think about the last few years, are you seeing kind of a gradual change or is it up and down, you know? This is an issue I struggle with a lot. <clears throat> There's, there's no doubt in climate change. I mean, I, it, it's happening. The effects on maple, I don't know. You know, maples go from North Carolina to the Hudson Bay. Mm -hmm. And in Ohio, we have such a good climate for maples to grow. You know, is four or five degrees going to make a difference? I don't know. The thing that I think concerns me more is what will it do to the general all the insect species and you know everything that affects the, the, the you know just the environment they live in uh, as far as the tapping season we have records in our sugar house that goes back to the 1940s so you know and, and ours is just a, a very small area that, that that you look at you know in the whole maple belt we have tapped a lot in february we have had several years where we are done by the 1st of March. But again, we are about weather, we're not about climate. Yeah. You know, we have to have that change. And so, how does climate change affect weather? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. You know, there's a guy that used to tap every year at Christmas, because that's when he had help to tap. He had 6,000 taps. <laughs> so he would tap every year at Christmas, between Christmas and New Year. And he would make some syrup in January. We have always had the January thaw. He would make syrup in February. And by March, his tap holes were dried up, so he was either re-tapping or quit. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I do know that it's a concern. I do know the growth rates are a concern. But you know, some people think that it will help our industry from a production standpoint because it will give us a longer year. And we have the technology now and the way we manage tap holes, that we can keep those tap holes fresher by, by using um, new spouts and you know, just methods the way we tap and the vacuum systems and the closed systems. You know, we, we keep that tap hole fresher longer, mm -hmm. and so we can have a longer season. This year we had an eight-week season, you know, which most years ends up being a really good year. This year is kind of an average year. So, you know, it, it's, I don't know the answer to that question. Yes, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the scientists, the scientific models are kind of telling us that too. I mean, uh, I, in my opinion, one of the initial mistakes was to call it global warming because that gave a lot of people, especially in the northern climates, a warm and fuzzy feeling that well, what's wrong with a little warm, warming. But actually what the, most of the models are showing is that the weather patterns are going to be unpredictable. And that's, I think, something that we have more and more to look forward to in, in the future. Uh, John, uh, your bill. Uh, so I take it that uh, you know, a lot of different county and, and, and state agencies would have to be involved and there's a lot of record keeping and, and all of that. So uh, are these agencies on board with this? Have you, have you had discussions with them on how to, the logistics of it and how to, how to accomplish that? That's an excellent question and I know that I've caused my auditors heartburn already <laughs> because they're the ones that are going to have to adjust uh, accordingly. Uh, so Sometimes when you introduce a bill, and, and this was one of those, there were so many good ideas, I wanted to get the conversation started. And those of you who know the General Assembly uh, understand that there, there, there's, uh, it, it's like maple, the maple production. There are times when things are really running right, and then times when the tap hole dries up. And we're going into one of those seasons right now. It's election year, and uh, there's going to be a long break, I'm told, this summer. So uh, the question is, the other groups on board, uh, I think that there's going to be support for this uh, in concept. Now, will that translate to votes? That's where uh, being bipartisan, and there's uh, both parties uh, on board with this, uh, pockets within both. We'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. 
the, the, the cards that I'm looking to play, though, are, are these. Water quality, critically important, especially with what's going on. Habitat preservation and the timber in industry and the threat of invasives. I mean, you start looking at this bill beyond, I know, with the newspapers. It's HB 606, if you want to look it up. They, they branded it as a maple incentive bill. Well, it is, but it's far more than that. And, and maple is a way of getting a, a toehold, if you will, into some of these other issues that we really start, have to start uh, uh, examining as a, as a state legislature. Thank you. Questions? I'll open it up to the audience. Chris? Yes. Good morning. Christy Lakey's with the School of Environment and Natural Resources. So um, I'm interested in ideas that you have with youth education, particularly urban youth, and teaching them about maple syrup and the maple industry and forestry. Thank you. Move the mic back. Uh, well, <laughs> you can actually, I think easier would be for you to come, come up here maybe. Maybe it's just a question. <laughs> Well, as a former teacher, I'm excited that you asked that question. <laughs> there are a couple of things going on in my backyard, and I hope it's replicated. Uh, my wife, also a teacher, 35 years, has been spending a lot of time at the Nature Conservancy's Grand River Campus, where busloads of students are coming out day after day because they've tied this into the curriculum. And it was cute the other night. My wife was up studying trees and their life cycles, and uh, as a, she's a phys ed teacher, retired. Uh, so it was neat just listening to her coach herself as to what she was going to uh, share with the children. So there is, especially with, with the curriculum that we have in the lower grade levels, uh, a, a certain uh, almost natural, uh, if you will, synergy between what is happening in our forests, in our woodlands, and the curriculum especially in Northeast Ohio where kids are used to seeing the buckets and such. The other component of that is um, the fact that, that some of our maple producers, this Maple Madness Tour is just fantastic. If you ever get a chance to participate, uh, I was all excited about the pictures you, you uh, showed there, Dan. Uh, one of my former students is part of the, the maple producers and he has gone above and beyond the call of duty to bring kids in to educate them because if we don't educate our youth as to the importance of conservation and the balance between preservation and economic progress, the synergy there, uh, we really have to get this right with our kids. So I think there are pockets uh, statewide where this is taking place. It, it, it's a natural progression, but I, I also think we, we can do more to promote it. Yes. And for that, the other, and I'll use this. Uh, I was just curious as to the, the, the extent of the hobby producers that are out there. That I'm a hobby producer, and I was actually down in Athens County, and I was uh, at a, actually a, a, a Good Works as a, as a mission uh, program down in, in uh, near, near Athens, or north of Athens, and on their little campus that they have there, they were uh, there's a, a hobby producer there. Now, they only tapped, I think, 25 trees or something like that, and most of his are box elder um, that, that they're tapping. But I was wondering about the extent of the, the hobbyists that are out there as far as statewide, that yes, there's so many producers seem like are in the Northeast, uh, Ohio, but how, how really how widespread is it around Ohio? And then what opportunities for education, opportunities for the you know, support for the, the House Bill 606, how might others who are interested in it might benefit all of those kinds of programs by bringing in all of those who, are, you know, even like I said, the hobbyists or that are just interested in it? Just curious. Yeah. <clears throat> the short answer to that is we don't know how many hobby producers are out there. We know there's a lot. But the great thing about Maple is, as I stated earlier, the process is the same exactly the same whether you have two buckets or 200,000. 
You know, you, you, you just remove w water, add heat, and, and you have a great product. Um, the, the thing from an educational standpoint that we need to do <coughs> is make sure we all end up with the same quality product. And there are standards of production that need to be hammered and hammered and hammered. SAP has the shelf life of raw milk. So at 35 degrees, no big deal. At 70 degrees, really big deal. You know, the last two years, those warm weeks in, in, in February, they create a lot of issues because you just can't process sap fast enough. And I, and I don't care whether you're a hobby producer or, 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 or whether you're on vacuum tubing systems. And you have to make the decision, what do I do with that sap? You know, those are the issues that, for hobby producers or whoever, they're, they're the, same, the same issues. So um, I know in Geauga County, uh, less over he does, uh, uh, oh, at least two or three times a year, he does a 101 workshop for hobby producers. And then that may get expanded around some around the state. So th th there may be opportunities there. Uh, the one thing that I can't let go, I should let it go, but I can't let go. <laughs> if you talk to dealers, and, and Geauga County does a wonderful job of, of, uh, of marketing. They do. But they're probably not the leading county. <laughs> <laughs> and again, tubing systems have changed a lot of things. But hopefully, you know, it doesn't need to change the perspective. But uh, I just can't let it go. Sorry. <laughs> there was another question. Yes. So I have uh, a question sort of along those, the lines of the last two questions. Um, my name is Beth, and I am the uh, Director of Outdoor and STEM Programs at Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland. We have an educational maple syrup production program um, over in Galloway, Ohio. So I was wondering, as uh, someone who has uh, a youth uh, educating program, uh, are there resources to uh, kind of connect with folks who are looking to come out and learn about the science of maple syrup? So, you know, when it comes to, to resources um, on the maple side, I would say that for us in extension, we have um, a maple syrup specialist, but he's half time. And so we don't have a lot of focus on the maple side. I get I shouldn't say drug necessarily into the maple side, but because of the forest management part of it um, and not necessarily the maple production part of it. So um, not a lot of resources, at least on our end. Could there be? Sure. I think that's an area that we could look at um, and maybe try to expand on. We're looking at some of that up on our Mansfield campus of maybe trying to expand some of that, but um, it takes time and resources. As far as the, from the Ohio Maple Producers Association, um, we monetarily we can't offer you much. You know th there are, there's more information on the web than you can ever want from you know from other states, um, from the the Acer site out of Canada. Uh, they have so much good inf educational information on that site. Um, the problem with the with the maple education while we're making syrup is we're too busy to teach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can develop programs for non-producing times of the year, you know, then maple producers are more than willing to, to participate. And I guarantee you that there is not a maple producer in the state that will keep secrets. You know? <laughs> we share what we know. And the industry's that way nationwide. So I guess that would be my, you know, concentrate on the web and then try to, to, to do a, you know, plan your activities non-maple producing season. I think we will wrap up. Uh, we are almost out of time. Actually, we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much again uh, for, for being here. Uh, Jeff will uh, have some concluding remarks. Thank you, everyone. This is our tradition at the Environmental Professionals Network. We have a certificate of appreciation here for each of you. Um, Image with a lovely maple syrup.
Christine, and I think it's very true that maples Wonderful. are uh, a um, uh, lovely item. Um, uh, just as an aside, in terms of this educational opportunity, I want to highlight the fact that our students, our capstone students, went up to Mansfield this last year to sort of like study what was the landscape up there, and, and some of them came across some maple there. So I would not be surprised in the near future whether Ohio State University will have a modest uh, maple enterprise on one of its campuses, and I think that'll be a great learning opportunity to sort of spread the news. I think in the future and stuff, as I've sort of come to appreciate the forest industry and the school really is adapted to sort of like the changing dynamics out there, I think there's some opportunities for us to do more in this space. So I think echoing Kathy's thing is we haven't we don't have a lot of capacity but I think uh, uh, we're building it out um, I just want to bring to your attention that um, uh, uh, we had a lovely day today thank you very much to our cater um, as you know as we move into the summer months the environmental professionals network goes on the road and so uh, one of the exciting things we're going to be doing this year is uh, um, in our June um, program is we're going to be heading out to uh, um, uh, in good days catering uh, the hive and hemisphere coffee roasters in Mechanicsburg uh, to celebrate local food, environmental, sustainability, and community. So if you have an interest in joining us on that tour, you can see information on the back here. But it'll be a great opportunity for us to get out in the field, and we do this traditionally during the summer months. Uh, transportation will be provided right here at the 4-H Center, and it'll be a 40-minute drive out to Mechanicsburg. So if you want to join us, uh, we'll head out there, visit the, uh, um, um, the operation, and learn more about uh, where our food is coming from for our le these lovely breakfasts. I also want to just plug that um, the uh, uh, School of Environment and Natural Resources uh, Alumni Society will be hosting a program out at the zoo on May 19th if you have an interest in taking the family and, and being part of a kind of an EP, a special kind of EPN event that we'd like to invite you all to, to participate in. Um, talk to Mark Giese, who's our alumni director over here, and he can um, visit with you. So um, we did have a video we were going to share with you, but for the sake of time, we're going to pass on it. If you have some interest in learning about the forest industry, we have some great experts here, and please step up and visit with them. And we have a number of folks in the audience, too. So anyway, thank you for uh, your attendance today, and uh, have a great day.